it's a, a real pleasure to um, welcome you all. And um, first of all, happy Liberation Day, as well as uh, happy Independence Day. And um, I was privileged to um, be with Neil and others in the stadium earlier today. Mm -hmm. And um, really experience uh, more than the event, but the emotion of what the day meant. And um, it was uh, a mix of emotions, I might say. Um, first of all, realizing you actually are sitting where thousands were killed. Mm. And recognizing that we were back there now, um, 25 years later, uh, at the heart of where innovation was growing and accelerating, uh, where the role of women has emerged in a leadership position, not just for the country, but I think for the world, and where the power of youth is so obviously harnessed. I think one of the most uh, extraordinary uh, comments made by one of the, um, sing the dancers was that they were all under 25, mm. um, which means they hadn't experienced um, what had happened all those years ago. And many of them may well not have been with us today if it hadn't gone well. And that really drove home very clearly the reality that change, even when it seems so bleak and dark, happens. And I'm hoping that part of our panel will explore a little bit of the underlying questions of how can the unthinkable become a reality? What are the tough changes that we often see and we believe are intractable, that can change. What is it in our minds that allows some of us to see the clarity of the vision of what can happen, while others block out that vision and believe the old ways are the only ways? What does that mean for the way we address the science of the future, the partnerships, the way we build um, towards the future? And when I'm thinking about these things, I'm thinking in two different domains. One is the domain of government. <clears throat> Today we experienced um, a government that has truly emerged as a leader in terms of placing the values of society way out front, backing them with investments in science, technology, young people, and women. And yet that's kind of rare. I, I'm a South African by birth and now a US citizen as well. And I still wish that both of my countries would have the vision and the ability to drive the future far more on science and technology and the empathy than we have today. That's on the government side. And I'm hoping we will hear some examples of the best government practice and maybe some of the worst and how we address them. But that's perhaps less where I hope we'll go. I hope we will focus on some of the more intractable issues of our time. Um, we heard so much about climate change here and how we're seeing science and technology op offering opportunities um, to address the fact that the internal combustion engine can actually be placed in history within the next few decades. Uh, that coal companies are transforming uh, to sustainable energy companies. I hope we'll take that further and ask, what will it take for food companies to transform, both in terms of reducing waste and becoming healthier? And something I know all too much about, what will it take for tobacco companies to transform and reduce the risks of their products? What are the essential criteria needed for all of these to change? Because I believe, overall, there are three big things that I hope I'll test with my panel are essential for even the toughest, dirtiest, filthiest legacy companies to change. And they all seem to boil down to technology, science, and innovation that truly reduces risk, risk to the human, risk to the environment. Secondly, governments who have the capability to regulate in a smart way and regulate in a light way to drive the innovation out of the industry, the entrepreneur, for real sustainable change and not block change. And finally, the demand of people for products that are truly healthier and more sustainable. If all three don't happen, 
we don't land up having progress. If all three are in sync, I believe we can have progress, and that's why we're seeing an acceleration out of the combustible car engine of the past, um, out of some of the dirty energy sector, and even, I might say, the movement to reduce risk products on the tobacco side. So with those few opening comments, uh, let me start off by turning to Samir, and my job here is not to introduce, certainly not to introduce Samir. Um, <laughs> that would be uh, impossible. Um, but r really, um, to, to ask him about the fact that he is uniquely placed intellectually and by his own background in understanding the nexus between the power of politics and economics on the one hand and science and technology on the other, given that he has a deep insight on the cybersecurity as well as the climate change technical issues, as well as the politics of them, to answer, I think, a fundamental issue of our time. I've been so impressed to hear how often the fourth industrial revolution has been mentioned in this audience. Mm. It is the driving force of everything we know in society, for good and for bad. The problem is that that's known well by the scientific community, the researchers, and I would say the private sector, not so much government. And you might say that the regulator and those involved in ethics are slipping further and further behind the rapid advances in science and technology. How can we actually start grappling with that? What's it going to take for the two to be in sync so that we can really have the progress we want? That's a simple question, clearly. <laughs> uh, you know, so let me try to respond to this by uh, going back in time and digging a research paper that I had written a few years ago for uh, one of my courses in Cambridge and use a table that I vaguely remember and try to produce some numbers to come up with what is the political economy of climate change and climate response. In, 20, in 2009, if I remember correctly, during the London summit, the G20 summit, uh, the big men of the world leading their countries walked up. You know, this was one year after the financial crisis had hit all of us. And London was the call to do something about saving the financial ecosystem. We would all go down. And you had uh, President Obama, uh, you had uh, uh, Hu Jintao, and you had a galaxy of leaders walk up to the mic and pledge $1.5 trillion to save the banks, $0.5 trillion to save the bank, $700 billion to save the bank. And if you were to, if I was to remember the number correctly, those 20 odd people in the room pledged close to $5 trillion of some kind of support to save the financial ecosystem. Six months later, the same men and another 100 gathered at Copenhagen for the climate summit. And together, these alpha males could not even agree to a number of $100 billion to save the planet 10 years from then. So clearly, the message that went out to everyone was that the bank was worth $5 trillion, the planet was worth $100 billion. <clears throat> now, don't expect regulators, policymakers, and the incumbent industry to change when the political signaling is this. And guess what? Let's try and take that $100 billion. It's, it's not there. And it won't be there. Even that won't be committed. On the other hand, let me give you another number. Again, from that time, 2011, my paper is slightly old. The numbers must be much larger. But I added up all the polluting industries and did an analysis of the TV ad spend in the United States of America. In the United States of America alone, all the high polluting industries spend over $1 trillion to increase their market share. They spend $1 trillion on your televisions, on your computers, on your radios, in the shops, in hoardings, in airports, to make you consume more, to make you emit more, to make you believe that pollution is a normal way of human existence. I'm just mm -hmm. framing the debate by capturing the political economy, that trillions of dollars are spent to promote pollution, and a feeble $100 billion is considered enough to respond to that. That's, that's uh, one dimension of it. The second, economic growth, 
and innovation growth has fast out, outpaced regulatory growth and institutional growth. It's not that the institutions are always malevolent or vile, they are incapable. They do not get it. Most regulators... So, so what are we gonna do? So there is only two ways to do this. One is the dramatic way, the Marxist way. And I, I mentioned it lightly yesterday, but at some point many in the world are going to start demanding accountability from those who get it. And guess what who gets it? The private sector. At some point we should demand that the boardrooms of companies who regulate our, our, our virtual worlds, our uh, flora and fauna, our roads and electricity should be accountable to the citizens they serve. It is time perhaps for some form of a mandate requirement from the citizens, from the locality, from the community, from the countries they serve. Is it time to elect boardrooms? Is it time that Mark Zuckerberg needs a wider mandate to be the chair of Facebook than just his shareholding? And I think that's one way of accountability. That's one dramatic way of putting it. The second, and I think this is possibly the middle part, you will have to allow the newcomers, the new industries, the new thinkers, the new actors, space to challenge the incumbents. You'll have to create an unlevel playing field. I think I hate this word level playing field. There is no level playing field. Countries benefit, uh, industries benefit because they are there. When you want a level playing field, you have to tilt it slightly so that the newcomer has an advantage to compete, can, can compete. I think you'll have to create an unlevel playing field in the regulatory space so that the newcomer can match the spending power and the, the, the inertia, the momentum that the incumbents enjoy. So what is a market, a regulatory response? Change the uh, playing field. The second is a, a, a legislative response that countries will have to start demanding the same level of accountability from boardrooms that have greater implications on their lives than governments where they, uh, of the countries where they reside. I just worry about that because it sounds like it's potentially regulatory capture. If you're a big dominant company in a sector and you know there are many startups actually finding solutions to reduce environmental and improve health conditions, the first thing you're going to do is to toughen the regulations to make it impossible for them to compete against you. And so it's like a, a circular argument. So I, I, I would hope that we would go to an additional way and that is the power of consumer power buying the voice of the investors. And just one last quick question is, do you have any faith in the growth of um, ESG or environmental social investing, um, the whole uh, investment world where we're yeah, seeing yeah. leading investors place SDG goals alongside their commercial goals? No, absolutely, I am actually, uh, so one of the things I did early on in my career was to produce something called the BSE Green X. The Bombay Stock Exchange has a green stock exchange. It's only the third in the world. Uh, very few people know that I created that exchange and, and transferred it at, uh, at the princely sum of zero rupees to uh, the Standard and Poor's who now runs it. So that was my uh, project in Cambridge which was transferred to uh, a commercial operator for free. But uh, I have seen India, change its climate position. I've seen Indian companies change their outlook towards uh, renewables uh, by the power of markets. I think if you get the financial signaling right, you get the uh, regulatory signaling right, not necessarily regulation. And if you get political leadership that is able to motivate consumers and citizens to demand certain behavior from those who serve them, you can move the needle. India is last year the largest installer of renewable energy. 2009, India was the head of the global trade union, stopping progress on, on deploying massive mitigation measures. So you have seen that in less than a decade, India has outperformed by four times per capita the renewables deployed in the US, two times per capita the renewables deployed in China, similar number as the US for Japan, and it competes with Germany. That's great, thank you. And I think some of the figures about the transformation in India since the start of the climate change talks we heard about from the um, former ambassador of the Maldives, I think were very, very exciting and very promising. Neil, let's change tack a little bit, but not so much. Um, and um, Neil has an extraordinary background, um, somebody with depth in the, the science as a pediatrician and also as a television producer. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but... Um, Anybody who hasn't watched at least one or 50 um, of the Law and Order series 
um, I think must probably doesn't exist in this room. Um, <laughs> And what I find intriguing about both Law and Order and some of the work um, that he's done is it's actually embedded science into a popular culture. And I know many people, starting with my son of 16, who will tell me, uh, did you know about X, Y, and Z, some ways of detecting um, chemicals or toxins? And I thought he's had a new chemistry class or something else and going on school. No, he was watching Law and Order, or the classes. And I, I say that because um, I, I'm from South Africa, where um, years ago, uh, Soul City was created as a popular entertainment medium to embed the stories of AIDS and what needs to be done into the popular culture without wagging your finger and saying, go and wear a condom and go and protect yourself. It was the stories of humanity. And I always, when I think of what Neil's doing, it's doing what I fail to do. I'm an epidemiologist. What we do is we focus on the data, we wipe the tears away, we wipe the emotion away, will the storyteller bring them back? So he must know more than anybody, or many, the answer to these tough questions that we're facing now in a world of fake news and post-truth in the scientific era, where anything seems to go. We have vaccine hesitancy rising, we have fears of uh, scientific progress, which seem on the one hand irrational, but for some people are rational. How does he think we need to approach this, given the fact that he's sitting at the absolute nexus of media and communication and science? Well, that's an easy question. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I, I've been thinking about these issues, both the unthinkable, as you, as you um, spoke about in the beginning, and, and how to tell accurate stories, or, or as accurately as we can. Now, a, a good example would be the story we told on ER about HIV. It was in um, 1994 when we first, we were the first um, show to depict a character with an uh, who, ongoing diagnosis of being HIV positive and not dying a terrible death because we had no uh, treatment before 1994, 95. And then we followed this character as she was treated with antiretrovirals and we dispelled a lot of myths. And we actually know that it had an impact because I wanted to know, does what we do make any difference? So we did the first study that we published in the journal Health Affairs in 2000, where we looked at human papillomavirus and cervical cancer. Oh. And we did a short story on ER with Juliana Margulies' character where she uh, diagnoses a uh, young woman with cervical cancer who's been exposed, exposed to HPV. This was before the vaccine was available, Gardasil. 20% uh, of the audience, and we did, a, we did this in partnership with the Kaiser Family uh, Foundation and Princeton Survey Research. So 20% knew that HPV caused cervical cancer. This was in 2000, before watching the show, and it was a, an, an N of over 1,200. And after the show aired, we resampled uh, we, we revisited a, a, a random sample of viewers and 60% knew. So it really gave me pause at that, wow, we didn't, as you said, wag our finger, we told a story. And th then six weeks later, 40% knew, and there's always a decrease, so that's why I think that repeats are good boosters. Um, so this really got me thinking about how important accuracy is because, as Derek just said, you know, now with the explosion of of uh, blogs and podcasts and commentary and ideas and, and new techniques for um, informing, quote, informing people about issues, um, how do we dive through all this? Particularly because we know that from that study, and it was the first done, now many more have been done, people do learn from television and they believe what they see because we try to make it look like it was a real hospital or a real police station or in my show now, the White House and designated survivor. So I think about that, and one thing we did was we partnered with the CDC. Uh, they would send us uh, information and studies, but writers aren't interested in that. They want to know just what the so-called facts are. And facts change. The facts changed, if, you, if one can say that. What we thought about HIV obviously changed as we learned more about it. So we have to be open to the fact that science is always learning, is always pushing forward. The way we treat many diseases is very different today from the way we treated them in the past. Sickle cell disease, for instance, is going to be treatable. Um, it is already treatable in experimental studies. It's not the way we used to treat it. 
there are still many arguments in science about prostate cancer, breast cancer, how we diagnose it, what are, what are the, the best uh, practices. And we keep trying to do studies in peer-reviewed journals to, to come up with the best practices. But science is not something that is, is, is um, more abundant. It's changing, too, as we gather more information. So I, I'm aware of that. And we, with Norman Lear, the very well-known producer, he gave money to the University of Southern California, an organization called Hollywood Health and Society, to provide accurate information to writers so that, <clears throat> for instance, with vaccinations, they would tell what we know, what, what was studied, what was presented in the, the, the journal Lancet, how it was refuted. And, and there is another case of vaccines and autism being disproved when the person who wrote the original study um, revealed that he had made up the data. Right. So we, so we, we try to be as, as accurate as possible because I think it's really important to give people accurate information. I think that's the ethical thing to do as well. Um, in dealing with, but we also have to be open to the fact that, it, that, that we learn more and we refine. Um, I think about the unthinkable all the time in, in my shows because I do know that my show is a conduit for getting out ideas. And as Derek also said, he, as an epidemiologist, facts we know from, the, from a, a very brilliant um, researcher in, in the United States named Paul Slovic uh, at the University of Oregon that people do not pay attention. Viewers do not pay attention to data. A good example would be if, if I tell you that there are, I don't know, 100 billion pounds of plastic waste in the oceans, people go, wow, that's a, that's a problem. But if you, as you know, the tortoise that had the straw up its nostril caused policy change in the United States in terms of plastic straws. It was one story, not a story of huge numbers. Or when we just saw the horrifying event of the father and daughter dying, crossing the border in the United States, that enraged people and it got them yeah. going because it was a story that was emotional, that it touched their hearts. Then we can contextualize the issue and give data. But when we start with data, there are this many thousands of people and this many thousands in Syria and this many millions here, people just shut down. I think you know we're learning more about the neurobiology of storytelling and that we're not wired to understand that. And, and Slovic wrote a very, very important piece called Why We Don't Pay Attention to Genocide. It's too much. But if we can tell a story mm -hmm. through novels, art of plays, movies, poetry, music, it touches the heart and the mind. And we have to try to do that. And that's why do people love stories? Why do they fortunately like SVU or ER or, or, or designated survivor? Because they, they, they um, identify with the characters. And then we can give them the story. So I do the unthinkable. For me, there are four areas that are unthinkable now that we have to think about. Right. Global warming, AI, um, CRISPR, and nuclear uh, weapons. So CRISPR is something that's not talked about really unless you re kind of dig into the, the stories. And CRISPR is a genetic technique like scissors and glue. You cut out a gene and replace it with someone else's in, in um, vitro or in utero even when they're doing, uh, you know, implanting an egg. And it has been done in China and it raised a lot of hackles from scientists, I, I think rightfully, because we could start to change human evolution. But we're not talking about it. Our government in the United States doesn't talk about it. There are senators and, and Congress people who talk about it in terms of, of bioweapon threats, because we'll be able to, to do things that, we, that were unthinkable, as Derek said before. So for instance, on my show, I, I talk we, about. Maybe we can come back to sure, that. To decide. Sure. So, so we talk about these kinds of things. Let me, let me go on to, um, or we talk about opening the backlog of rape kits on SVU, which has had a huge impact on opening kits that were never tested. Somebody was sexually assaulted. They went through a very rigorous and, and emotionally trying test, uh, gathering evidence, DNA evidence. It wasn't tested. Hundreds of thousands not tested. Now they're being tested. That's because of Mershka Hargitay and the, and the show putting forward this story in an emotional way. When Derek talked about reducing the risk, I think that's really important. But I want to say that there's a difference between reducing risk and reducing harm. So when we talk about reducing risk, we have to 
to keep in mind that that's one approach. But reducing harm is not the same thing as reducing risk. And so when I think about technology and science, I think that science can help us in understanding how to reduce risk and how to reduce harm. But in terms of tobacco, for instance, uh, smokeless tobacco is not an innocent um, element that we can just, you know, or, or um, IQO, IQOs. That is uh, an approach to possibly reduce harm, even though NIH has, has published studies that show that it's very debatable whether it does reduce harm. So we have to be very open and, and clear about this notion of reducing harm and giving voice to the consumer. So that's the last thing I'll talk about for a moment. Very concerned about this. I think consumers should have a voice, but it is not a level playing field. And this goes back to the soda industry. Choice, give them choice, give them 10% less sugar, et cetera. No, <laughs> choice does not exist apart from advertising and the billions of dollars that these emotional stories are being told Coca-Cola, uh, open life, live life better, refresh, et cetera, tells a, an emotional story. And if the playing field was level and people were not getting the story that was influencing their choice, quote, choices, then I'd say, yes, it's always about consumer choice. But consumer choice is always influenced by storytelling, just in the way that I tell stories um, about whatever topic I choose, and it's because of my interests, consumers are absorbing the stories, and they're absorbing the stories that Derek is telling and that I'm telling about reducing risk in smoking and having choices in soda, when we know that in the United States, for instance, when I graduated from medical school in 1996, 15% of adults were obese. Now it's 40%. We can argue about BMI, but we know that there's a big problem and that 30% are over weight, and that we spend six, three, $325 billion a year in the United States on treating type 2 diabetes. So we've got a problem, and we have to tell the full story, and the full story is very complex. And there's a lot of debate, to... and there's a lot of debate in science literature about this that I'm sure Derek and I can debate too. Yeah, so. no, we will, because full disclosure, I used to work for PepsiCo. And I think that gave me insights that um, very few people in academia or haven't been inside a private company understand. And that is what motivates um, a change inside a company. It's so simple from looking in to just attack all the big multinationals in the world and say all they're doing is imposing these terrible products on us without understanding what are the true drivers of change, which do relate to strong market forces as well as consumer insights, but also to R&D. Before I go on to... But let me just uh, respond no, to that. Let me respond to, to that, Derek. Two, out of, three, to two out of three people who smoke cigarettes die from smoking. So if we want to reduce harm, let's have people not smoke, not just Very you know, nice burn idea, to, but unfortunately, tobacco. the reality for most smokers is that they want to quit, but they but, fail to. The yes, because you all lied in your sense. science. You all lied in I, your uh, so-called no, science. No, uh, let's move on. And we could talk about this. Can I moderate Alan the Brent. panel? I'm no, going this. we need to talk about this, Derek, because we need to be open. We need to be open. <laughs> and the, open. The, world, the World Health Association, Derek, has said, the World Health Association does not want to work with you. And the Indian government just said, do not take money from your smoke-free foundation. So let's just, let's really well, let's, be, let's be well, let's, honest let's, can talk I, about can I, can I, Guys, can I just get yeah. a word in? Yeah, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I think, I think, I, 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 I think, I, I think uh, I should moderate this panel. <laughs> let's move on to Tosin. Uh, I'm going to second I, that. I, I think as the chair of the conference, <laughs> I'm stepping in. Uh, it's, it's my platform. And uh, I am stepping in. So good. I've, I, we have heard from Derek. We have heard from um, Neil. Now, now I'm going to conduct the rest of the 25 minutes. Thank you very much. I am now going to go to Tosin. Yeah. Tosin. <laughs> no, <it's the> <laughs> Tosin, I am going to ask you the question that I think we have been debating for the whole day today. Yes. The question is women first, women in leadership role, women designing strategies and policies of the future. My question to you is that women, are women in leadership roles going to produce different outcomes? Do you believe a development agenda led by women has led to significantly different uh, 
policy results. Thank you for the question. I have to say I feel rather boring after that now. <laughs> I don't know. I might put everyone to sleep. I'm not as exciting um, as everything that just went down. I was very excited about that. Um, so you don't get to experience that on panels, right? So that's, that's good. Everyone is awake now. Um, <laughs> So thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's a very sort of layered question that um, we must be careful not to oversimplify. Obviously, as a champion of women, I always believe that we should uh, play um, more significant roles in all the spaces, uh, from politics um, to business and so on and so forth. We need uh, to be more visible in all of those spaces. However, I think uh, it would be an oversimplification to say, therefore, that when we have women in power, uh, that automatically results in, um, let's say, the achievement of certain development uh, goals or, or things like that. I think we obviously have to take it as a case-by-case -case study because um, women are human beings first, um, as are men. And so whatever your, I would say, driving um, sort of uh, purpose is and, and wherever you go is what's going to determine the outcome and so if I'm a woman um, and let's say my character is such that um, you know we've had that in, in my country where I, I see the the coffers as my own personal bank account then I will probably do the exact same thing um, as a man would do that's just the truth all right so it depends on character however what I can say is that several studies have shown that women in leadership roles tend to exercise um, what we call skill sets, um, soft and hard skill sets that are very different from what, what men exercise. And so there was a recent study um, that was published by McKinsey and it stated that there are some leadership behaviors uh, that women tend to kind of um, focus more on than let's say the men. And some of those include people development, um, expressing expectations and rewarding success, role modeling, inspiration, and uh, participative uh, decision making. And so we, we know that um, women do have certain skills and talents, right, um, that maybe men are not quite as strong as. Uh, but I think the key when we talk about leadership, when we talk about women's role, is to talk about it as more of a um, diversity of um, inclusion. And so how do we bring both players to the table? How do we make sure that women are equally represented the same way we have the men? It's not to say that women have to be the only, you know, if it's not women-led, then it's not good. It's how do we make sure that we have their voice on the table and that we also have the men on the table. So gender inclusivity is what I support. And what we do know is that when companies are gender inclusive, meaning that the women are also in leadership roles and that their voices are also heard, that there is a 30% higher return on investment. That's a fact. We know that, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that we can definitely focus on those kinds of statistics to say that when you do have women at the table, the decisions and the outcomes are different when you consider both. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, and so then, you know, one of my favorite stories right now in speaking about kind of the difference that we're seeing in terms of leadership, you know, I just pointed out some of the skill sets that we see with women that are a little bit different, is right now I have a favorite, and she's the Prime Minister of New Zealand. I'm sure people are very familiar with her. Yes, yes, yes. She's Isn't she amazing? Um, we're seeing her play on soft skills. You know, when the massacre happened at the mosque, we saw the difference in how she approached, right, this whole situation. She approached with empathy, right? She approached with understanding. And that made a difference in how that country was able to move forward from that incident. And then when she took it, you know, uh, to parliament, what did we see that happened? There was a vote for gun control, but she didn't stop there. What she then did was that she then incorporated into their budget, I don't know if anyone knows this, well-being line item, well-being. So now they have a budget that's set aside for mental health, child poverty, um, domestic violence. Now I'm not saying that the men in the room may not have done the same, but I have to say that these sound like things that are top of mind for women most of the time. And so we're seeing the shift in how New Zealand is being led because of this woman. And so I think we must give credit where credit is due. But like I said, I will not say that you know, to solve the world's issues or to solve the development problems we have in Africa, the solution is just simply to put a woman in power. I will say that we need to have more collaboration, inclusivity, and so on and so forth. 
Thank you. You know, and we must also, in, uh, just to take that example uh, to a different region, yeah. I think Angela Merkel and her response to the refugee crisis mm -hmm. was also something which was special. She was eventually bullied by men in Europe, yes. but, but I and think... we saw what happened to Theresa May. Theresa May. Yes, we so, saw that, so... So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, I think uh, uh, the next point that I want to raise with you is that if women were actually creating the political engagements internationally, so, yes. you know, uh, the Swedish... Uh, the foreign minister is promoting the feminist foreign policy. You know, yes, there's this yes. new agenda. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's time to bring women in to design how countries engage with each other? Do you think that will change uh, the nature of the zero-sum game that men thrive on? So this doesn't have any statistics. This is just me talking from my gut. And I think the answer is yes. Because I think women, so I'm not, this is not scientifically proven, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like all the women in the room will agree with me. We just make decisions differently, right? We think, we think through things. We think through things. Again, this is not scientifically, and I'm not going to bash the men, but, you know. Um, you know, I, I need to <laughs> hand over the mic to her. She should moderate this panel. I'm a, you know, I would be honored to do so. So, so um, proceed, you take the mic and solve the problem between these two men. I'll get to it. <laughs> right after this, I'm going to get to it. We're going to have a mediation, and I'm going to say, come on, guys. Come on, boys. Let's settle down and figure this out now, like Dr. Wright. Thank, Thank you, Tosin. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Wonderful uh, Ambassador, let me come to you. Uh, I think alongside the transformation in choices, behaviors, marketing, uh, and of course, technology itself, that means human existence. Uh, I spoke about foreign policy and international engagements, and I think uh, you, are, you were one of the biggest donors uh, in the world. You supported many countries, uh, mine included. Uh, the Green Revolution perhaps would not have been possible without the partnership with you as the big uh, industrial uh, units in many parts of the world were cur curtsy, one of the four generals that you sent out, General Electric, General Dynamic, General Atomics, and General Motors. So, so uh, you know, you were this, uh, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, uh, opening the treasury, much like China is doing today, and spreading Lord's good word. Uh, you have changed. Uh, you are now talking about partnerships, moving from the aid regime to a trade and development partnership perspective. What does that really mean for countries who are now partnering with the U.S. Thank you, Samir, and, and it's been interesting to listen uh, to this panel so far. I'd just like to try to, to answer your question, but also tie in some threads that have been raised by the other panelists. There was a mention uh, at the get-go from our initial moderator, um, Derek, about the, in, the issue of innovation and challenging science, and especially with the anti-vax movement. There was a mention um, by Neil about cervical cancer. There was a mention by uh, Tosi about uh, the role of women. And I'm going to give you a story, and there's a talk discussion across the panel about stories. And in Rwanda, if you, you can tell stories at night, but if you tell them in the morning, you become a lizard. So I'm glad I'm on an evening panel, not tomorrow morning's panel on the role of women. Um, and the story I'm going to tell is to answer or to also answer your previous question because I think they're tied together. Because partnership means listening. And in, a, in my case here, working in uh, Rwanda and previously in Ethiopia, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of women leaders, um, both at my own embassies. I work for uh, women ambassadors. Uh, and here in Rwanda, my country team of, of agency and section heads is majority women. But here in the country of Rwanda, half the government ministers are women. And while my good friend is the minister, she's a woman minister of, of gender, it's also the minister of agriculture and health and ICT. And the question that was asked of Tessie about whether they make a difference, and again, this is not scientific, but it's a story. And a story that goes back to the question of cervical cancer and the issue of HPV. The previous health minister heard that story, heard that, read those facts and read those re that research, and decided that she was going to vaccinate every Rwandan or, or get the possibility so that every Rwandan could be vaccinated uh, for H HPV. And this with a view, a long-term view of preventing cervical cancer. And she did it. And that's never been done in any other country, uh, almost 100% vaccination rate. 
And that's a success story. It, in the meantime, there's still cervical cancer and there still needs to be treatment for those type of non-communicable diseases. But listening to our partners and what they see as the need and the important argument about equity, that it shouldn't just be basic problems, that problems that affect any human, whether it's in Rwanda, the United States, Ethiopia, Nigeria, mm -hmm. India, that everybody should have that access to that and potentially be a leader and an innovator in addressing those challenges. So as a partner here in Rwanda, I think we've learned and we will learn about what innovations in treating health like that can have. And I think the newest, the current health minister has a similar ambition with, with hepatitis C and the vaccinations for preventing hepatitis infection. So as donors, uh, traditional donors, to start listening, start listening to the women leaders in governments that we work with as partners is critical to changing the framework. And I think that then helps move from a donor framework to the partnership and the self-reliance framework where we in turn learn from our partners about innovations that they have led. Uh, Ambassador, let me ask you another question. Uh, listening is good, but I think one of the uh, speakers during lunch this afternoon, I think it was Candice, if I remember the tweet. I, I, I unfortunately was not in both the rooms. I, I was watching the tweet, uh, tweets. She mentioned that Africa has so, much, so many solutions, so many ideas, so many innovations, uh, many of the technology uh, companies that are creating uh, you know, uh, services for people today uh, actually have been motivated by many of these traditional uh, uh, you know, realities of, of um, uh, communities in this uh, continent. Are you being able to create a reverse funnel? Because I still see it being one directional. You're listening to help them. Are you now engaging to help yourself by what they are doing? I, I think certainly. And I think I mean, we need to do more of that. Um, and for example, Zipline, uh, it's Anybody who's Googled Rwanda probably also uh, reads about Zipline. This is a drone company that works with the government of Rwanda, different agencies and ministries in Rwanda, to help deliver blood products and plasma and drugs, anti-venom, uh, different pharmaceuticals, to every part of the country by drone within 30 minutes to an hour at the most. That's not being done anywhere else. It's shortly it will be d done in Ghana as well. But that's something where regulators, an earlier question about what governments can do are learning from Rwanda about how the technologies and the regulations can enable business to provide solutions that people, again, whether Rwandan, Ghanaian, or American, need. I I'm going to give the mic to you, uh, the original moderator, uh, <laughs> and my friend Derek. Uh, I, and I'm going to pose the question, uh, Neil, of course, posed more eloquently. Uh, there is certainly a debate that while technology is uh, good and technology, and in fact, I made this point earlier, technology sometimes normalizes behavior that we want to, to do away with completely. There is a school of thought, and it can't be wished away, that uh, harm reduction, e-cigarettes, like he mentioned, I mean, I don't know the name you mentioned, IQOS, IQOS or something, that was the name you mentioned? You know, he mentioned a particular name. Um, I mean, I know friends who work uh, in different companies in Germany, they sell different products. So I have used a few that you get in Frankfurt Airport. I, sorry, I'm a smoker, I, I seek forgiveness. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'll be born again next life, I won't be smoker, I promise you. Uh, so so uh, my question to you is that there's a genuine debate um, of whether we want to do away with certain behavior or do we want to normalize a moderated version of it? And that's the essential point Neil is making, that uh, are we, uh, I mean, for example, let me flip this question, then. why is it so difficult for technology-led smoking companies to announce themselves as technology-led smoking companies? So why brand yourself differently? Why not, you know, for example, Uber was a non-taxi company giving you taxi services. Why is there this um, huge urge to brand products in different ways or is there certainly a difference? I'm asking you this question up front. Thanks, and it's, it's a great question. I think first for the audience just to remember that, of course, um, I and I think everybody would not want anybody to smoke, anybody to vape, anybody to use any tobacco-related product. But the real world is different. 1.3 billion people smoke in the world. Almost half of them just in China and India using tobacco products and they're dying at a rate of between seven and eight million a year. 
the rate of progress is way too slow. If this was HIV AIDS and the deaths numbers up there, you would be outraged, you'd be in the streets demanding either better cessation products, which haven't been introduced to the market for 20 years, or demanding better action by governments, which say they're doing things, but basically are not doing anywhere where they could, compared to many of the developed countries where we are seeing progress. That's the spirit I came into this, and it's the spirit after spending 10 years at the World Health Organization, leading the organization into the first and only treaty in any health field to address tobacco. So I know what the tobacco industry has done, is done, and will continue to do. But I know something else, that when I speak to smokers, they are desperate. Every day, they're looking for a solution. They're looking for something either to never smoke again or to continue to get their nicotine, which gives them what they feel is some pleasurable sense. And it's not my right to judge whether they actually want that or not. There was never a way out of this until the last seven, eight years that now we actually have got what are called reduced risk products. And I won't go into the details of them. So when I saw this happening, that was the trigger to start saying, how do we get serious funding to actually accelerate the change so we can save lives, reduce the impact, and so on. I know the science is not perfect, and you're absolutely right. But what I found very interesting is that the broad field of what's called harm reduction, all harm reduction is, is basically incremental change. It's not doing things perfectly. In a perfect world, and I was at WHO, we would say you should all walk 10,000 steps a day. You should eat a certain amount of calories. Your food, diet should be whatever. Most of you are not going to do that. You're going to do something in between. That's going to be a reduction in your risk quite dramatically. Hopefully, many of you are going to engage in sex with somebody you don't know will use a condom. That's harm reduction. Many of you will use needle exchanges to lower your drug. So, so That's can, commonly can, known. Can I ask you yeah. a follow-up? Why are you, or, or why is it uh, blasphemy then to be put through the same standards of regulation that those products are? Or the same standards of testing? I mean, that's the question Neil made again, that you don't have uh, enough scientific data to, to make claims whether there is harm reduction. And that, that was the point yeah. he was making. Well, let's just say that are you making claims without having been put to test? And I think that's a valid we, question. We're making, no, we're making no claim. What we're saying at the moment is we do need better science, and that's where we're going to place our money. We're asking anybody in the room to submit research proposals to test whether e-cigarettes, reduced risk um, products and whatever truly have long-term benefits. The emerging science suggests a few things. Number one, if you are in India and you're a Gutka or you're a PAN user, your risk of oral cancer, terrible cancers, which you probably know well, are eight to 10 times greater than if you use another smokeless product called SNUS, which happens to be made by some other companies. Imagine if there was a switch there would be a reduction of huge amounts in oral cancer. That is a fact. That's not any more beyond dispute. It's based on 40 to 50 years and explains why Swedish men have the lowest lung cancer rates in Europe by far and why their women don't, because their women prefer to so, continue using cigarettes and don't use snus. So now we are in the last 11 um, minutes, and I think we have heard everyone. Uh, Almost. <laughs> Almost. Uh, I want to bring some of you in. Uh, although I'm enjoying this conversation more. Now, uh, and before, uh, as you line up and ask those questions, there are mics uh, uh, in the aisle, you can just walk up and ask that question. Uh, I would take two or three from you. Let me ask Tosin, because she's the wise one here. How would you respond to this proposition that there are technology products, and as Neil rightly says, they may not have passed through the same rigor of testing as they should before we reach those conclusions, but if there are solutions, how would Tosin-led regulatory mechanism respond to such a proposition? Um, I think I definitely um, appreciate the point of view of both uh, gentlemen. And what I also have to say that um, I agree with what you said in terms of the fact that we are dealing with human beings. There's a lot that's happening very fast. And it's not all the time that regulations can sort of keep up with what's going on. Um, and so we know that with vaping, for example, teenagers have 
completely embrace that, at least in the US. It's, you know, they, they can take it to school, their parents don't even know. Um, and it happened so quickly um, that the parents were not even able to kind of get in front of it. That's just the truth. Um, and so I think, you know, understanding that there are some things that are going to happen um, outside of our control. Uh, there are behaviors that humans will make, like you said, um, that are not ideal, but they're going to make them anyway, regardless of what we have you know, recommended as best practice. And so then what needs to be done? Well, then we go back to what uh, Neil said, which is that we do have to go through the regulatory process. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to be very careful in the narratives and the messaging that's going out um, during that period um, when we don't yet know for sure um, what the risks uh, or the benefits are of any of these things. And, and so I think I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I think I'm being sort of like uh, a buffer state right now. <laughs> Just trying to... I am I'm actually the, the buffer state. Oh, are you? Okay, all right. I wasn't... <laughs> we can both be. <laughs> but, 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 but Neil, let me ask you a question. And, and uh, I think we have heard you loud on this. And yeah. I think you have a strong uh, opinion on this, and which, is, uh, which is valid. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, which the world, which is open and free and must debate, uh, yeah. actually should cherish and, and admire. Let me ask you a question. In that same study that I mentioned in my intervention earlier, when I said a trillion dollars are spent mm. to promote bad behavior, yeah. I basically said bad behavior. Yeah. I also did a second layer of study. I went to the balance sheet of media houses in 2011 when I did that study, or 2010 when I did that study, and I found that the most profitable channels, or in fact, the only profitable channels, the news, were, the news channels were making losses. The only profitable channels were actually, actually Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, these, these baby channels, the kids' channels. And I, it, it dug a, I, I went a little deeper to understand what was happening, uh, and I came across a stunning reality, that each of the big auto major had a partnership with one channel. Hummer was partnering with uh, Cartoon Network X, they, uh, Toyota had sponsored most of the programs in Cartoon Network Y, and General Motors was sponsoring a child before five had identified with brands. Storytelling that you mentioned too. Mm. Isn't that true of everything you do? My, my question to you is mm. that be it stories of change, positive change, that you define as positive, or stories of, of, of deviant behavior, mm -hmm. we have done it since time immemorial. It's nothing new. And how do you, as a storyteller, and someone who also raises money or is sponsored by others, respond to this uh, certain duality of positions? That I make good movies, but guess what? My financier also funds the casino, uh, 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 casinos in Las Vegas that leads to families getting uh, poverty-stricken and desperate on the streets. That's a good point. Well, this is uh, you know, a question of, of our times. I just read, for instance, that students at Harvard demanded that the university divest in fossil fuels, and the university said no. Um, that's an example of, you know, that's supporting the, the business of the school in the investments. And so, it, you know, and if you, if you divest in one, does that mean that you have to start divesting in others, and it's called a slippery slope? And so where do ethics stand, and where does, um, you know, doing what's right stand? So. You know, when you, you know, I did shows on broadcast network that were sponsored by soda companies and not cigarette companies, because that wasn't allowed anymore, uh, but car companies, cereal companies. You know, we've got a lot of data about all of that that we talked about. So um, that's why I like being on Netflix, because there's no advertising. Um, and I think that that's, a, that's really kind of important, um, because uh, except for that they, you know, Coke is integrated in Stranger Things, and then there was a big mm -hmm. debate just the other day that they're smoking on Stranger Things. And so this is, it, it is, as, as you're saying, it's the culture of our lives, and, and our brains are wired to like things that maybe aren't good for us. And so I think that it is incumbent on us, and as parents and, 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 and physicians, you know, and, and people who care, to try to talk about these things and, and encourage behavior and model behavior that's, that's appropriate. Um, but these things need to be paid for, as you just said. But there is a difference between, you know, there's a reason why cigarette 
advertising isn't around anymore because we know it hurts people. We know that encouraging people to smoke is something bad. We know that using role models of young people to encourage smoking is not a good thing because it encourages kids to smoke. And we know that smoking is bad for you. So it depends what the harm is, really, and it is uh, equivocal because some things cause much worse harm than, than other things. So if you have a sponsor you know, that makes puppets that's, you know, and, and it's on Nickelodeon you know, or SpongeBob, well, that's great. That's not really going to harm a, a child. But if you're promoting products that you know, we have some evidence, or some, in, in some cases a lot of evidence, that it is harmful, then that's where we have to draw the line, I think. It's not just everybody gets to advertise whatever they want and you know, let people make a decision. Because I said, and I think this is what caused some of the calamitous discussion, which is <laughs> everything has an impact in the way that we tell stories. And stories are not just on you know, a 42-minute show. The stories are everywhere. You walk through stories. It's, it's, it's advertising is, the, the best stories are advertising. I mean, I, I encourage you to see this Coke Latino advertisement. It is amazing, and it, 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 it's an advertisement about how uh, Latino families are proud of their names, and so then you can buy a can of Coke and tattoo yourself with your name. It's brilliant. It is an amazing story, and it really is moving. But is it a, a good story to tell? Well, I'll, I'll leave that to you. But that is what advertising is about. It's to get you to buy things. Uh, deal, fair point. Uh, let me move to, uh, I have decided I'm not going to take audience questions. This is far more interesting right now. Um, uh, and, 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 I, and I am maintaining a very precarious balance here. I am not going to disturb that. I am going to, uh, I am going to control this conversation, and all of you are going to jump at all of them during dinner. So that's the plan. So, uh, so, so allow, me to, allow me to complete this session. Uh, Tosin, yes. storytelling. Yes. The same stories that uh, tell people to buy things yes. or get the cards sold in markets also define gender roles. Yes. How they tell you pink, they tell you blue, yes. they tell you Barbie doll, they tell you the color of the Barbie doll. Yes. And I told you an example in the morning about the, uh, the artificial, artificial intelligence and yes. the sex robot. Yes. So we are creating stereotypes and we are creating roles and we are creating leadership mm -hmm. dimensions perhaps at a world leader. How do you respond and how do you challenge these stories that are keeping back the right kind of yeah. people from Saving the world. You know, I think uh, narratives are a very important thing that we must continue to talk about and challenge in all spaces and places, because uh, narratives have the power to, to sometimes do more harm um, than good. Um, I'm Nigerian, so I relocated back home about two years and some change ago, and I very quickly um, realized that the narrative around women um, is very damaging. Um, and I think that's probably the case in many other countries that are similar, developing countries. And so what do we do about that? I think that you know, change doesn't come um, all at once. It just has to do with awareness. I think that, for example, social media is, uh, it's both good and bad, but you know, there's some good that's coming out of that in, in terms of the awareness and what uh, people are being exposed to that's different from what the culture tells them. Um, the work that we do in our individual spaces is important. So maybe as a whole in Nigeria, um, I won't be able to make uh, you know, widespread change in how people think about what women can do and not do. But I can tell you that on social media, um, just a few days ago, there was um, what I would call a hellstorm um, over um, a woman who was sexually assaulted by a pastor. And that then led to, as you know, there's a Me Too, you know, we know that the Me Too hashtag took off in the US. Well, guess what? It's now in Nigeria. And it was loud and it was furious and the women stood up and they said enough is enough. And they got the pastor to stand down and now he's gonna be, you know, hopefully charged to court. Then a video, literally two days after that, a video of one of our senators came out where he was beating on a woman. Um, in a sex shop randomly, <laughs> who knows, you know? And so that happened and all of a sudden everybody said they're still angry so everyone said he has to come down too. And so why am I saying this? The narrative starts to change 
with the awareness, with the exposure. And so all of a sudden now there's a generation of women like myself who are saying, we are not our mothers, we are not our grandmothers, and we are going to demand certain things, and we are going to get certain things. And to now add to that, because I'm a woman in tech, right? And so now I'm trying to think, we're going into a future, we're already in the future where, you know, everyone, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, but girls are still being told things like, in my culture, probably similar in Indian culture, you can be a doctor, engineer, and what's the third one? Lawyer, we all know. And so, but that's changing because we've started talking about how now we're going to start seeking more right-brained um, talents, creative, um, critical thinking. And so now we're starting to see programs that are focused on girls and technology, you go on social media, you can click on hashtags, you'll see programs, you'll see all kinds of things. So what I'm saying is that these narratives are not gonna change overnight, but I think the interconnectedness of the world now and the exposure that's happening is driving change, even in countries and places where the culture has been so oppressive for so long. Um, we're just seeing women finding their vo voices and I'm, I'm really excited about that. So I hope in the next 10 years, we'll be talking something completely different you know, than what we're talking now. So.